Thank you for that introduction, John, and um, also thanks to the academic board for <clears throat> inviting me back to talk about Dante, and especially to Stephen and Genevieve Overy for making the events possible. Um, the talk, this first talk is going to be focusing on some of the later cantos of Purgatorio, um, in particular cantos 21 to 30. Uh, as you know, the Purgatory is the second part of the Divine Comedy, the first part being the Inferno, where uh, Dante and his guide, Virgil, go through the earth, pass into the earth, which is hell, and they come out, eventually come out the other side into the southern hemisphere. And that's where the island of Purgatory is in Dante's imaginal geography. And from the island of Purgatory rises Mount Purgatory, which is very interestingly directly across from Jerusalem. It's an important detail. Purgatory in Catholic theology is a, a place for purification, so, so uh, the souls of those who die in a state of grace or a state of um, uh, awareness or uh, mindfulness of the divine who are still not ready for the celestial realms go through this process of purification before going to the celestial realms. This is represented in Dante through the various levels of the mountain of purgatory. So there are seven, seven levels or terraces, each associated with a sin, a, a sin or a state of spiritual blindness. And the top three terraces are connected with sins of the flesh, um, prodigality, um, or avarice and gluttony and lust. So Dante and uh, Virgil are climbing the mountain through these, uh, past these different terraces, and then after they pass through the last of the ter um, terraces, the terrace of lust, they go enter the earthly paradise. And along the way, they've met the poet, the Roman poet Statius. And and the earthly paradise is where Dante finally is reunited with the beloved of his youth, Beatrice, who, he hasn't, who died when they were young. And then, as I'm sure you all know, she's his guide in the earthly paradise and then up through the celestial spheres. So in those uh, terraces just before the earthly paradise, uh, those three, three sins of the flesh, very interesting detail there is that Dante encounters a number of poets. And... Uh, five poets to be exact, and I'll be talking about them, but the, it, it, it stri has struck me as always, I've always been unsatisfied with the, what commentators generally say about these encounters because everyone recognizes Dante's coming to terms with his poetic past. He's meeting these poets, they all represent some aspect of his, his art, and he has often been described as being a, um, as a, a kind of artistic purgation that goes on there, goes along there. But that strikes me as being a too purely literary interpretation of it. For Dante, these things are never separate. What, what is it besides the literary themes that are going on there? How does it tie in with the rest of the, um, of the Divine Comedy, and in particular, this, this part of the Purgatorio? And how does, what is the relationship between these encounters with the poets and his, him entering earthly paradise? And the title of this talk, mentioning this dream of Leah and Rachel, he has that dream right after the encounters with the poets and right before entering the earthly paradise. So I just I asked myself, what, you know, what is the connection between self-purification, which is obviously a main theme in Purgatorio, or purification in general, and artistic mastery? And how, is this a, how are both of those connected with the earthly paradise? So I just... The, the talk really comes out of those questions I asked myself, and I noticed certain things as I was rereading those cantos that gave me the, you know, the main theme for this talk. So my talk will follow up on those themes. Uh, just before Dante and his, and his guides, the poets Virgil and Statius, entered the earthly paradise at the summit of Mount Purgatory, Dante has a dream. It is his third and final dream in Purgatorio all of them occurring just before dawn. This is the hour, Dante reminds us, for visionary dreams, ones that alert us to essential reality in symbolic form. 
In this dream vision, he sees a beautiful young woman who is gathering spring flowers in a meadow. As she walks along and picks the flowers, Dante hears the words of a song she is singing. The lyrics of the song say that her name is Leah, and you can see the lyrics on the handout that was on your seats. Still singing, Leah adds that she uses her supple hands to weave a garland of flowers with which she adorns herself so that she will be pleased at what she sees when she looks in her mirror. Her sister, Rachel, she continues, never tires of gazing into her own mirror, which she does all day long, day after day. Leah's song and Dante's dream conclude with these words. She, Rachel, desires to see her own lovely eyes, as I, Leah, do to adorn myself with my hands. Seeing, or vision, is her delight, and doing, or working, is mine. Given the timing of this dream, just before Dante enters the earthly paradise, it almost certainly is meant to encapsulate something about that place or state of being. As you probably know, Leah and Rachel in the Old Testament are wives of the prophet Jacob. And in Christian tradition, Leah is a figure for the um, active life, while the life of doing, while Rachel is a figure for the contemplative or interior life. Clearly, Dante's dream imagery refers to this tradition. According to the scholastic thought, oh no, I'm sorry, we also note that Leia is practicing an art. She is weaving a garland. That was one of the first things that struck me. It's just a very interesting image. She's weaving a garland. So she's practicing an art. Because according to the scholastic thought that informs Dante, art is a virtue or power of the practical intellect, a knowledge about how to order materials, in this case, flowers, to make something, here a garland, that Rachel represents contemplation or vision, we can confirm in a passage of Dante's unfinished work, The Convivio. Dante uses mi mirror in imagery there to convey the nature of true philosophical speculation or contemplation. He writes there in The Convivio that the philosophizing soul, quote, not only contemplates the truth but moreover contemplates its own contemplation and the beauty of that contemplation as well, turning back upon itself and falling in love with itself through the beauty of its first gaze. The word speculation is related to the Latin word for mirror, speculum. Here the mirror is the human soul, which is the place, say Christian theologians, that human beings can come to see God. In Paradiso, Dante will sometimes refer to the blessed spirits in heaven as mirrors because they reflect the divine light. And late in Paradiso, at the end of Canto 29, Beatrice tells him that God is a unity who breaks into countless mirrors, yet who always remains one. And the contemplative gaze is in love with these mirrors. And for Dante, contemplation is the basis of all art and making. Art requires discernment into the true nature of the thing to be made or represented. As, as Dante writes in the Convivio again, the artist who wants to represent something must first perfectly be within that thing's being. So there's an inner connection to that thing's being in order to represent it. Therefore, some kind of direct seeing relatively undisturbed by the artist's ego is inherent to it. Also fundamental to the idea of art in Dante's culture is the notion that all work in making, not just what we call art today, is the practice of art by which human beings made in the image of God further reflect that image. Dante states this parallel between divine art and human art quite explicitly at the beginning of Canto 10 of Paradiso, where the reader is urged to gaze on the cosmic order. The annual path of the sun in relation to the earth, Dante notes with wonder, is so perfectly angled that it enables the succession of the seasons and makes life itself possible on earth. And the cause of this wondrous order is, quote, the art which that master, God, 
who loves it, that art, within himself so much that he never takes his eyes off what comes into being in this manner. L'arte di quel maestro che dentro a sé lama. In other words, the creation itself is the result of the art that arises from the loving, contemplative gaze of God. And human art is a faint reflection of this ontological and metaphysical reality. In Dante's dream, Leia and Rachel combined can be seen as figures for artistic mastery. Note that Leia too, after she has made the garland, looks into a mirror. The two feminine figures constitute a continual cycle between contemplation and doing, knowing and making. Dante commentators recognize that this dream, which occurs shortly before the dramatic scenes in the earthly paradise, represents the perfecting of the active and contemplative lives necessary for regaining that paradise. I have not seen any mention, however, of an implied association between this active and contemplative perfection and artistic mastery, understood in the broad sense I have sketched. Yet this association is striking when we note that the dream of Leia occurs not only just before Dante's arrival in the earthly paradise, but just after a series of canto cantos that feature Dante's meetings with a number of poets, as I mentioned in my preamble. We will look at the poet and poetry episodes later on, but for now I would like to note that one key scene takes place between Dante's dream and his entry into the earthly paradise. In this scene, Virgil tells Dante that because his will has been purified through by going through the terraces, climbing Mount Purgatory, it would be wrong now not to follow it. His will is pure, so now he can follow whatever impulse comes to him. Since Virgil's declaration of Dante's newly purified state comes directly after the dream of Leia and Rachel, a connection is implied between the two, art and contemplation on one hand and self-purification on the other. As I mentioned, in Dante's understanding, all art and making requires that the mirror of the artist's intellect or soul be polished. The artist can't represent an object if his or her mind doesn't grasp the essential reality of the thing to be represented. And this idea is common among visionary artists and poets. Um, Wordsworth, for example, says that the poet doesn't write from emotion, but from the, the um, recollect, emotion recollected in, in tranquility, was his famous quote. Um, and William Blake argues that a condition for inspiration is the removal of the delusory state of the ego. He calls the specter. He describes this process in his poem Milton, which and these lines are on that printout as well. A false body, an incrustation over my immortal spirit, a selfhood which must be put off and annihilated always, to cleanse the face of my spirit by self-examination, to bathe in the waters of life, to wash off the not human. The not human is the spectral self or ego. Both Blake and Dante say that when the doors of perception are cleansed of ego projections, we naturally see God everywhere and see in all things in God. This liberated vision is what Dante describes in the earthly paradise. As he puts it early on in the narrative there, the earthly paradise is given by God as the pledge or bond of heaven. And this, this claim that is given as the uh, earthly paradise is given as the pledge or bond of heaven reminded me of um, the famous words of Blake as well, that uh, poetry, painting, and music are means for conversing with paradise in the present age. If we see, if we see that those words of Dante as the, the pleasure bond of heaven as re referring to, if we think of the earthly paradise as being itself a, um, the realization of art in its full sense, we can associate that with um, Blake's um, saying about um, the arts conversing with paradise. In some passages in his writings, Dante refers to the state of inward receptive receptivity as the good disposition of the material on which the spirit may do its work. In the Convivio, for example, he says that the divine goodness 
descends into all things, or else they could not exist. But although this goodness springs from the simplest principle, it is variously received, either more or less, by the things that receive it. The primal goodness bestows his benefits and gifts on things in a single stream. Indeed, each thing receives from that stream in accordance with the mode of its power and being. The great opening of Paradiso says the same thing, that the glory of the one who sets everything into motion penetrates the universe, shining in some parts more and in others less. In human work or art, the material that is penetrated more or less by this light is the mind or soul of the artist or craftsperson. Self-mastery and self-purification prepare the soul so that God, the artist, who in Christian thought is ultimately the only artist there is, may work upon and through the human artist. At the same time, immersion in our work is vital to our self-transformation and self-realization. Idea, this idea is common to many traditions. Um, in the Bhagavad Gita, for example, it says that the self-realization comes about by devotion to the work that harmonizes with one's true nature. And Plato in the Republic even argues that this is the basis of a just society. At the same time, for a Christian like Dante, being in the state of original sin meant that from early on in life, the material of our human nature is poorly disposed to the influx of grace. So there's this need for purification. In Western Hermetic tradition, some have spoken of two phases of the purification or transformation of the soul, the so-called lesser mysteries and greater mysteries. Initiation into the lesser mysteries leads to self-integration, where the soul is restored to its essential or primordial state while the greater mysteries lead to self-transcendence. The so-called lesser mysteries enable contemplation of the inner essences or principles of created things. What the Greek, um, the Greek Christian Orthodox call um, the, the logoi. Hence their re relevance to the work of the artist. <clears throat> The greater mysteries lead to contemplation of God and the spiritual intelligences. So in Dante, in the earthly paradise on the top of Mount Purgatory, we can see an image of the initiation into the lesser mysteries, whereas the later, in the, in the Paradiso, the Empyrean and the higher heavens are an image of the greater mysteries. In his treatise on monarchy, Dante describes these two stages of imitation in Aristotelian and Christian terms. He says, ineffable providence has set before us two goals to aim at. He says, um, he says that the, there are two goals because there's a goal for our, the corruptible self and a, and a goal for the incorruptible self. So for the, in, for the corruptible self, the goal is happiness in this life, which consists in the exercise of our own powers and is figured in the earthly paradise and happiness in the eternal life, which consists in the enjoyment of the vision of God, to which our own powers cannot raise us except with the help of God's light, and which is signified by the celestial paradise. You may recall that the climactic scene in Cantos 29 and 30 of Purgatorio in the earthly paradise includes a sacred allegorical procession, which recapitulates Christian hi history and culminates with the appearance of Beatrice in a carriage drawn by a griffin. The pageantry of the sacred procession is like a revelation of sacred art. It includes many products of artistry, chanting, metalwork, dance, solemn choreography, <coughs> drama, symbolic clothing, and so on, all going on in this um, procession. To take a phrase from the visionary painter Cecil Collins's definition of sacred ritual, the procession in the earthly paradise enacts, quote, kinetic participation in incomprehensible reality. Kinetic participation in incomprehensible reality. This is a striking way to put it, and it nicely describes all truly soulful activity or work approached with imagination. 
The revelation of Beatrice in the earthly paradise first appears as a bright flash of light that permeates the forest. Still unaware of what is about to take place, Dante hears a melody drifting in the bright air, exquisite music, which he refers to as ineffabili delizie, ineffable delights, as well as primizie dell'eterno piacere, the first anticipations of the celestial paradise. Right after this, Dante sees that the flashing light has drawn closer. The air under and around the branches of the trees becomes bright like fire, and the sweet sound of the melody has clarified into distinct human voices singing in a chorus. Dante sees what he thinks are golden trees in motion. Next, he realizes that the dazzling trees are actually seven golden candelabras, and that the singing voices are uttering a specific word, a joyous hosanna. This is the word in the Gospels that the adoring crowds exclaim when Jesus enters Jerusalem on his donkey, with the olive and branches, olive and palm branches scattered in his path. Dante immediately follows these lines with an invocation of the muses, asking for inspiration so that he may put into verse things that are difficult to comprehend. He reminds the muses of his long and arduous labor at the craft of poetry, for which he often went hungry and was cold and awake at all hours of the night. After the invocation, Dante sees the first figures of the procession, 24 elders dressed in white, who represent the 24 books of the Old Testament. As the seven candelabras pass by, they leave behind seven long, wide strips of color, their brilliance paint, painting the air high above like a rainbow. And the great allegorical pageant continues to unfold from there. All of this is a prelude to the arrival of Beatrice, who was announced with words from the Song of Songs in praise of divine wisdom or Sophia, the bride of God. Icons are images that convey our intellect to the sacred reality behind those images. And a sa saint or a holy person, we might say, is a living icon. In this scene in Purgatorio and elsewhere in Dante's writings, Beatrice herself is an icon. Ever since his early work, the Vita Nova, Dante has depicted her as the speculum Christi, the mirror of Christ and the apotheosis of his art. To give just one example of how this plays out in his poetry, it's interesting to note that Beatrice in the comedy most often rhymes with dice and felice, speech and happiness. And Dante often uses the verb dire to speak to mean to compose poetry. So the implication is that Beatrice is she who brings the felicity of poetry itself. As I mentioned earlier in the cantos leading up to Dante's dream of Leah and Rachel and the scene in Earthly Paradise, Dante encounters a number of poets who were significant to him in the development of his art. Each of these poets is undergoing purification for sin of the flesh, avarice or prodigality, gluttony or lust. And Dante and Virgil encounter five poets in these cantos. I, I put the names on the sheet for those of you who aren't familiar with them. Uh, the first century Roman poet Statius, a close poet friend of Dante in his youth, Forese Donati, the Tuscan poet Bonagiunta da Luca, the Bolognese poet and immediate predecessor of Dante, Guido Guinizelli, and the Provençal poet Arnaud Daniel. All of these poets represent different facets of Dante's long apprenticeship to his craft. To better appreciate the connection between self-purification and artistic mastery that is implied in these scenes, I will sketch what happens in them. The first poet who appears is Statius. Reinvented by Dante as a late convert to Christianity. There's no, there's no evidence that he was ever a Christian. It just Dante makes that part of his story. <clears throat> Dante pictures Statius as one of the souls saved by Virgil's prophecy of the birth of a child who will usher in a new golden age of peace and harmony. Many in Dante's time interpreted this passage and Virgil's eclogues as his unconscious anticipation of the coming of Christ. In Purgatorio, Statius also explains that a passage in the Aeneid about the devastating effects of the excessive love 
of luxury and possessions saved Statius from his formerly extravagant lifestyle. Just before Statius appears in the narrative, early in Canto 21, Dante is gripped by curiosity over why, at the end of the previous canto, an earthquake had rocked the mountain. Suddenly, Dante says, he notices a shade walking with him in Virgil. The shade is Statius, who has appeared seemingly out of nowhere the way the resurrected Christ appeared to the apostles on the road to Emmaus. The shaking of the mountain was caused, Dante learns, by the passing of Statius's soul to a higher level, signifying spiritual advancement. The pious spirits in the mount rejoice over Statius's newfound freedom, and their loud celebration shakes the mountain. Dante, uh, Statius had been prostrate on the terrace of the avaricious and prodigal for 500 <coughs> years, but his release was sudden. As he says, the will immediately and spontaneously rises once it is purified, since the soul is simply returning to its heart's desire, its inherent state of freedom and delight. It is clear from details in this episode that Dante identifies with Statius in various ways. He wasn't made a Christian by Virgil, as Statius was, but Virgil's example made Statius a poet capable of writing about gods and men, an epic poet, in short. Both Dante and Statius learned from Virgil how to use poetry to evoke noble human qualities such as piety and compassion. <coughs> Statius tells his two poet companions that the main model for his sweet verses was none other than Virgil's Aeneid, without which he would not have amounted to much. You might recall that Statius in the scene doesn't realize that Virgil is standing right in front of him. The passage where, St where Statius reacts to finding out that Virgil himself is present is one of the most humanly touching scenes in the entire Divine Comedy. As Statius attempts to embrace Virgil's feet, Virgil admonishes him with the beautiful words, Frate, non far, che tu sei ombra e ombra vedi. Brother, do not do that, for you are a shade, and a shade is what you are seeing. To which Statius responds with the equally lovely, Or puoi la quantità de comprender de l'amor che a te mi scalda, quando io dismento nostra vanitate, trattando l'ombre come cosa salda. Now you can understand the extent to which my love for you warms me when I forget our emptiness treating shades as a hollow thing, as a solid thing. The affection exchange between the poets is rather surprising and even nonsensical if we rig rigidly follow the old interpretation of Virgil as an allegory for human reason or natural intelligence. If reason and natural intelligence were all of virtu uh, Virgil's allegorical role, and the, this interpretation of Virgil goes right back to some of the earliest commentators, it would seem more appropriate for Dante to have chosen Aristotle as his guide through hell and up Mount Purgatory. After all, Dante was, uh, loved Aristotle, knew Aristotle very well, and Aristotle really was a symbol of natural, the natural intelligence. Um, but when, when Dante encounters Virgil at the beginning of Inferno, he doesn't describe him as the master who taught him how to reason. Rather, he refers to Virgil as the poet mentor, from whom he learned the style that made Dante a great poet. Again, something that Statius also says. Virgil in Dante's time was viewed as a poet prophet, a sage, even a magician, as well as the supreme master of poetic style. If we view the earthly paradise as the culmination of the lesser mysteries, Virgil would be Dante's initiator into those mysteries with which the development and discipline of Dante's art are closely bound. For both Dante and Statius then, Virgil the pagan was an evangelist of sorts, not only of Christianity, but of the good news of the art of poetry. As if to emphasize the extent to which this is true, Statius says, Tu prima min viasti verso Parnaso, a ber nelle sue grotte, e prima presso Dio maluminasti. You were the first to send me toward Parnassus to drink in its grottoes, and the first 
to light my way toward God. Parnassus, of course, was the ancient's sacred mountain of poetic inspiration. Estatius concludes, Per te, poeta, fui, per te, cristiano. I was a poet because of you, and because of you, a Christian. And this is where Statius makes the famous comment about Virgil's being a light for others, though he himself could not benefit from that light. Surely one of the high tragic moments of Dante's poetry. Facesti come que, che va di notte, che porta il lume dietro a sé, e se non giova, ma dopo se fa le persone dotte. You were like one who goes along at night, carrying the light behind him and himself not benefiting from it, but teaching the people who follow him. I mentioned earlier the names of the other poets Dante encounters before reaching the earthly paradise. Forese Donati, Bonagiunta da Luca, Guido Gonizelli, and Arnaud Daniel. In contrast to the Latin and classical Statius Virgil episode, these cantos involve vernacular poets of Dante's own epic. The only poet in all of these cantos is not a, who is not Italian is Arnaud Daniel, who speaks to Dante in his own native Provençal. Forese was a very minor poet, but a dear early friend of Dante in Florence. He died when Dante was about 30. He is notable in this context for his youthful exchange of scurrilous sonnets with Dante. For example, to Forese's teasing in a sonnet that the young Dante was a parasite who lives off the work of others, Dante had responded that Forese was a glutton and a thief. In Dante's three extant sonnets addressed to his friend, he accused Forese of being a good-for-nothing husband, a son who isn't sure who his father really is, a cuckold, and so on. Forese answered in kind with insults such as the accusation that Dante's father was a usurer and that Dante was a common thief. The mock ridicule of these poems and the slapstick humor in them became a model for Dante's style in certain coarse scenes in Inferno. But for the mature Dante, low or hellish surroundings are the only appropriate place for this sort of poetry. As he puts it in Inferno, one sort of language is appropriate for saints in church another for drunkards in a tavern. When Dante meets Forese on Mount Purgatory, his old friend is unrecognizable except for his voice. His face, like that of the other gluttonous souls, is marked by sunken cheeks and darkened eye sockets. He is in an emaciated state, which is an image of the starvation that gluttonous souls undergo to purge themselves of their attachments. Dante comments that it is a wonder Forese is already so high up the mountain, given his friend's rather relaxed attitude toward the spiritual life. He, jib he jibes that he would have expected Forese to start out lower on the mountain, therefore needing much more time to reach the penultimate um, terrace. So his in interaction with Forese in Purgatorio has an affectionate teasing tone reminiscent of the scene lower down the mountain where he encounters the slothful Florentine maker of musical instruments, Bellacqua, who enjoys poking fun at Dante's obsessive earnestness. It seems that Dante had a soft spot for unambitious but big-hearted and down-to-earth Florentines. Forese explains that his ascent was expedited by the prayers of his widowed wife, Nella, whose virtuous devotion becomes the foil for Forese's diatribe against shameless and immodest Florentine women. One gets the sense that perhaps Dante and he had enjoyed the company of those very women when they were young. Some critics have speculated that Dante viewed the poem genre he shared with Forese, the scurrilous sonnets I described earlier, as a form of literary gluttony. But of course, those poems are only an outward sign for an interior state. Dante viewed them as an aspect of the dissipation and lack of gravitas which he associates with that time in his life. As he tells Forese directly in this scene, quella vita, that life of being confused, self-indulgent, and dissipated is what Virgil saved himself, saved him from, rather, when he guided him out of the dark wood at the start of Inferno. Dante and his friend share in their common eagerness for contrition and divine pardon both having recognized the limits of their past lives. The dialogue that Dante has with the Tuscan poet Bonagiunta 
takes place in the middle of the Forese episode. Dante has asked Forese to identify some gluttonous souls who are nearby. One of these, Bonagiunta, was from the generation of Tuscan poets just before Dante. Bonagiunta asks Dante if he's the man who initiated the dolce stile novo, or the sweet new style of poetry, with the famous canzone that begins, Donne cavette intelletto d'amore, women who understand the truth of love. This poem, Dante's greatest early poem about his love for Beatrice, was a turning point in his spiritual and poetic development. Dante responds to Bonagiunta with the great lines, I mi son un che quando amor mi spira noto, e a quel modo che è dito dentro vo significando. I am one who, when love inspires me, take note, and the way that he dictates it to me within, I write it. The responsiveness to love's dictation that Dante mentions in these lines has to do with being open to imaginative and intellectual vision. The very opposite of the self-involved love poetry Dante has renounced. The new style is possible only for a poet whose powers of contemplation or inward concentration are equal to his technical skill. As Bonagiunta correctly observes after Dante's response, he and the other earlier love poets in Tuscany were tied up in knots in comparison with the steel novists. After the interaction with Bonagiunta, Forese, who has been standing nearby, re-enters the narrative. The overlapping of Dante's encounters with Forese and Bonagiunta suggests that the two poets, the two figures, are closely, if inversely, related in Dante's development. While Forese is associated with a period of youthful debauchery and the associated poetry, which had to be left behind, Bonagiunta reminds us of the birth of Dante's limpid and sublime poetry through his love for Beatrice. After Forese's departure from the scene, Dante follows along behind Virgil and Statius while they talk shop about the ancient Roman and Greek poets and discuss the craft of poetry itself. Dante sees a tree on the path in front of them. At the base of the tree, purgatorial souls are raising their hands like children begging an adult for a treat. A voice calls from the branches, reciting well-known examples of gluttony that led to suffering and dissipation. This scene is reminiscent of a passage in the Convivio which describes the illusory nature of desire, by which we think we finally will be satisfied when we get the next thing we want, only to find out that we follow that up with a desire for something bigger and better, or simply other. Here is the passage from the Convivio, which is also in that printout. And as a pilgrim who goes along a road he has never been on, thinks that every house he sees from afar is his inn, and finds that this is not so, puts his hope in the next one, and so on, house after house, until he reaches the inn. So does our soul, no sooner than it has entered upon the new and untraveled road of this life, direct its eyes to the aim of its supreme good. And thus, whatever thing it sees which appears to have some good in it, believes it to be that good. So we see small children desiring more than anything else a piece of fruit, and further along desiring a little bird, and then still further desiring fine clothes, and then a horse, and then a woman, and then modest wealth, then great wealth, and then more besides. And all of this happens because in none of these things does it find what it is searching for, while it, be which it, be while it believes it, while it believes to be finding it just ahead. <coughs> this charming passage is a figural representation of Virgil's lesson on love and free will that had occurred several cantos earlier in the Purgatorio. And the exact, it occurs in the exact center of the Purgatorio and therefore the exact center of the Divine Comedy. And so it's been recognized that this, this theme of love and free will is absolutely central to Dante. He really, he, he brings it up a lot. In that scene, Virgil acknowledges that the human soul is created to love instantaneously, spontaneously, and that it is highly susceptible to pleasing things that awaken desire in it. The soul is mobilized by everything that promises pleasure. 
The next stage of desire occurs when consciousness extracts an image or concept of the eternal attractive thing and opens that image out in the soul. The soul's inclination or leaning toward that fantasized or internalized object is love in its most general sense. With this inclination or love, desire seizes the soul, compelling it to move toward the loved objects, object until it finds satisfaction and pleasure. So, Virgil teaches Dante in the earlier Purgatorio Cantos, desire is a spiritual emotion impelling us along from thing to thing throughout our lives, as the Convivio passage shows. However, clearly we cannot live in the fully human sense merely by blind desire, since the distinguishing feature of human beings is the intellectual soul or the, the life of the spirit. So, Dante asks, if love is simply a response to something that presents itself outside of us, where does free will come in? How is it that some desires lead to bad choices and some to good? Virgil in Purgatorio answers that reason and discernment guard the threshold of assent to our conceptual images of desirable things. Thus, the proper relation of free will to desire is intimately bound up with the fullest expression of human, the fullest realization, rather, of human potential. Dante's definitive expression of this understanding comes in Paradiso, in Canto 26, where he is questioned by St. John on the nature of love. As Dante will say there, the promise of some good always rouses love in human beings. And this love is proportionate to the degree of goodness that awakens it. Since God is the good as such, whoever recognizes this truth will love God above all other things. Dante's reflections on, the, on this crucial subject resembles that of Greek Orthodox saints, such as Maximus the Confessor, Confessor who articulated in great detail the incremental relations between desire and free choice. And that, I'm, of course, not suggesting any influence on Dante here, but I, I found that the, what the Greek Orthodox saints say on this topic, is, is they, just are, they, they really clarify and it's remarkably similar to what Dante is saying about it in those cantos. Maximus's words on the subject go as follows. The wrong use of our conceptual images of things followed by the wrong use of things themselves results in sin or spiritual blindness. And Maximus adds that an intelligent use of conceptual images and their corresponding physical objects produces self-restraint, love, and spiritual knowledge, while an unintelligent use produces licentiousness, hatred, and ignorance. This is why in all wisdom traditions, watchfulness or vigilance is so essential to spiritual practice. Habitual thoughts bring habitual patterns of behavior and ways of treating the world and its creatures. As Dante puts it in the Convivio, when the most noble part of the human soul, the intellect, is afflicted with various maladies, it is impeded in its function, which, quote, is knowing what things are. Dante's speculation on this theme plays a central role in his work, at least as far back as the Vita Nova. It is a theme that is closely related to his growing understanding of his vocation as poet prophet. Through Virgil's influence in philosophical and theological, and his, uh, Dante's own philosophical and theological reflection, Dante went beyond his predecessors in poetry, in his understanding of love and desire, and this is intimate, intimately bound up with his achievement as an artist. The final poetic encounters in Purgatorio on the Terrace of the Lustful reinforce this impression. Here, Dante meets poets who are burning in the fires of lust, love poets. In particular, the father figure of the steel novists, Guido Guinizzelli, and Arnaud Daniel, a Provençal poet associated with a highly wrought, difficult style that Dante imitated for certain passages of his own poetry. It was not, the, as, it was, as was not the case with Forese and Bonagiunta, Dante admired and imitated both of these poets for their artistry, most specifically for their artful use of the modern verna vernacular. Of course, the Divine Comedy itself is in the Florentine vernacular. 
And poets like Guido and Arnaud were important role models for what the spoken word can do in poetry. When Guinizelli identifies himself, Dante says he feels an overpowering urge to leap into the flames where Guido is standing, for the pure joy of seeing him. To communicate to us how excited he is, Dante uses a simile from Statius. His urge to embrace Guido is like the zeal of the two sons of the Greek queen, Hypsipyle, who saw their mother among armed soldiers who were leading her to her death. The sons threw themselves into the midst of the soldiers and embraced their mother, drawing her away to safety. Dante uses the simile to convey a sense of his filial affection for Guido. Indeed, he refers to Guido as his poetry father, acknowledging him as the founder of the sweet new style. At the same time, Dante clearly has surpassed his early mentor. Having learned to adopt the high tragic style he learned from Virgil, Guido Guinizelli was never more than a fine lyric poet. To be a poet who has the strength, skill, and contemplative focus to write high epic requires a self-mastery and self-purification that Dante came to, as we have seen, later in his life. John Milton somewhere gives a, a nice image for the difference between composing lyrics and epics, something he knew quite a bit about himself. The lyric poet, he said, drinks wine from an exquisite goblet, while the epic poet drinks water from a wooden bowl. Guido, in the Purgatorio scene, interrupts Dante's praise by indicating a nearby shade, Arnaud Daniel, referred to by Guido as the Miliur Fabro, or better, craftsman in the mother tongue. Once Guido has asked Dante to recite the Lord's Prayer for him, he disappears into the flames again. Dante says that Guido in the flames looked like a fish in water darting to the bottom and out of sight. Arnaud is then given the final word in the sequence of cantos about poetry and, po and poets. Dante has him speak in his native Provençal, another honor Dante pays to an important mentor. The gist of what Arnaud says is, I weep tears of penitence, but if I am saddened by the memory of my faults, I am heartened by the thought of the eternal joy that awaits me. Interestingly, Dante does not use Arnaud's poetic style for the words he has him speak in Provençal. Rather, Arnaud in this scene uses a, a, a plain and simple style in contrast to his highly wrought and difficult poetry. It is as if Arnaud's lines indicate a kind of poetic asceticism. Since his style on earth was sensual and ostentatiously skillful. For Dante, perhaps the presence of Arnaud in this passage alludes to his own spiritual and artistic discipline, which resulted in the down-to-earth and always economical and forceful directness of the Divine Comedy. Now that Dante's encounters with the poets in Purgatory are complete, he passes through the wall of the fire of lust. And it certainly is interesting to note that of all the um, um, trials that the souls are go uh, undergoing on the uh, Mount Purgatory, the only one that Dante goes through as, uh, with them is going through the fire of lust. So he obviously identified with that in particular. This wall is the only thing left, Virgil reminds Dante, between him and Beatrice in the earthly paradise. The dream about Leah and Rachel that I described at the start of this talk occurs not long after Dante's passage beyond the terrace of the lustful. We are back on the cusp of the earthly paradise. What are some of the things we have seen in Dante's juxtaposing of self-purification and artistic mastery? Most simply, we can say that mastery of art is interior mastery, since art in Dante's understanding is an intellectual virtue that remains in the artist. For Dante, to master an art means finding a way of working that is harmony in harmony with human nature as such. His journey down through hell and up Mount Purgatory made him confront within himself what happens to human nature when it is distorted by turning away from the good of the intellect, which is God. On Mount Purgatory, he learned how contrition, acceptance, and reverence can restore human nature to its right place, rightful place in the creation. There is a progression in the late Cantos of Purgatorio. To sum up uh, what I've, what I've 
been talking about in a, I didn't talk about it in a, the order that it appears in the Purgatorio. So to sum up the, uh, the episodes, first, the encounters with the poets, through which Dante reflects on his own art and its relationship to sensual attachments. Then the dream of Leah and Rachel, the principles of art and vision, the active life and the contemplative life. Then Virgil's confirmation that Dante's will is finally purified. Then Dante's vision of the sacred procession, art as sacrament. And finally, the arrival of divinity in the form of Beatrice. Purgatorio culminates when Beatrice assigns Dante his poet prophet's role of denouncing the corruption of the church and renewing Christianity at its roots. Let me conclude by noting some of the details of the earthly paradise as Dante finds it. It is a place of virgin nature, so lovely that the most exquisite spring day on earth is but a faint suggestion of what the earthly paradise is like. We know that the beauty of the place is a vision of spiritual beauty because the phenomena Dante witnesses there don't have natural causes. The gentle breeze does not arrive from vapors as it does on earth, according to the science of Dante's time. Rather, it is made by the motion of the prime mover, the celestial sphere closest to the Empyrean or the highest heaven. This is why the trees are bending delicately toward the west. The breeze emanates from the east, from God. Dante compares the trees to those in the pine forest on the shore of the Adriatic near Ravenna. The seedless plants in the earthly paradise impregnate the air with their innate capacity or virtue, which passes down and generates plant life on earth. In other words, these are the archetypes of what Jakob Burma and Blake after him called the vegetable glass or mirror of nature. The water flowing in Eden, which is clearer than any water on earth, doesn't come from a spring that is replenished by rain, like earthly rivers, but derives its source directly from God. All of these details are in agreement with the notion that the beauty of God is the source of the beauty of every created thing. In the Platonic formulation, beauty is the splendor of being's intelligibility. This is why Dante depicts the earthly paradise as a state of being in love with the Creator. The spirit or guardian of the place is Matilda, depicted by Dante as a woman in love with the Creator. Dante sees her beside a stream gathering flowers, as Leah was doing in his dream. She is singing a love song to God, the psalm that says, For thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy work. I will triumph in the works of thy hands. O Lord, how great are thy works! At the same time, the language that Dante uses to describe Matilda, as well as some of the imagery in his scene, in this scene, evokes a genre of pastoral love poetry that Dante knew quite well. In the so-called Pastorella, a shepherdess or maiden was depicted in a fertile spring-like setting, with an emphasis that she was a woman in love. When Dante addresses Matilda, he asks her to come closer to the edge of the water. She is on the other side of the narrow stream, so he can hear what she is singing. And he addresses her with the courteous speech of a noble lover, but the only lover his words ultimately refer to now is God. Matilda embodies the state in which human love, freed of illusion, naturally reaches for divine love. The sweet new style used in this scene may seem to contradict Dante's leaving behind of his dolce stil novist past when he spoke to the poets in the upper terraces of purgatory, as I've described. But I think the opposite is true. The Matilda scene actually embodies the fulfillment or full realization or, in Aristotle's sense, the final cause of Dante's sweet new style. The sensually vivid poet Ovid, too, is in Dante's thoughts as he composes this scene. Aspects of Matilda recall Ovid's depiction of Persephone, who was ravished by Hades when he saw her alone, gathering flowers. Ovid's depiction of the Golden Age resembles Eden, as Matilda in the Purgatorio scene reminds Dante. She says that the ancient poets who wrote about the Golden Age may have been dreaming of this very place from atop Mount Parnassus. As she concludes, 
qui fu innocente l'umana radice, qui primavera sempre e ogni frutto, nettere è qui, e questo di che ciascun dice. Here the human root was innocent. Here is perpetual spring and every fruit. This is the nectar each of them, that is, those ancient poets, tells us about. In other words, the great poets have always found their inspiration from the primordial state of Eden that the purified Dante has now realized within himself. At the end of the Vita Nova, Dante states that he is not going to write any more about Beatrice until he has studied and prepared himself sufficiently. He is actually telling a bit of a white lie here, since he does, in fact, talk about Beatrice early on in the Convivio, at which point he again says he will not talk about her anymore in that book. The scene of Matilda and the revelation of the earthly paradise indicate that Dante's purification, mental, moral, spiritual, and artistic, is now complete. And in fact, several lines later, Dante witnesses the sacred procession that will culminate in the appearance, the apotheosis in the literal sense, of his art in the form of Beatrice himself, herself, herself. Thank you. <laughs>